Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool pinball repair video for you this evening. We have been working on this super cool Stern Flight 2000 pinball machine. It's a wide body. We bought this a while back. I asked Joey where we got it because I've been saying in the videos I don't know where we got it. But he bought it near here fairly inexpensively. It was in somebody's house. Uh, but someone at some point had started parting the thing. So the play field's really messed up. If you didn't see in the earlier videos, it's bad. But we're going to get it. The power supply was missing. We've put that back in. Uh, the solenoid driver board was missing. We rebuilt one and put it in. And then these boards were here and two of the displays are there. So on the last on the last video, after we got the power supply, solenoid driver board repaired. By the way, there's a part that looks burnt. Go watch the previous video. We took care of it. Uh, at the end of that video, we were able to get the game to actually boot. So the board has been hanging on all these years and actually still boots up. But today's video, we're going to take that out, service it, and put it back, and then hopefully it'll still boot up. But <laughs> we're trying to make it reliable and go ahead and service everything. So I'm going to turn the game on. Now there is an LED at the bottom of that board. And the Bally and the Stern games had a LED diagnostic code uh, that flashes when the game starts. So it will flash one time real quick, it's kind of like a reset signal, and then it'll do seven flashes after that as it tests the various things on the board, and then it should boot up. Quick flash, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that's how they boot up. And you can see we've got um, one display tripping, the other one says zero, but the board appears to be up and running. So uh, we don't have the play field in it yet, so we can't see any of the lights or anything. They're, none of them are hooked up on the back box anyway. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull this board out, and we're going to put it on the bench, look at it, take that battery off and just see what uh, what kind of condition it's in after all these years. The uh, the other boards that are in here are the two displays. This is the lamp driver board, the sound board, and the speech board. Or I think I may have that backwards. One of those is the sound and one's the speech. I think that's the sound and that's the speech. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull this MPU 200 out. We'll get a good look at it on the bench, and I'll tell you what we do usually to service them and uh, try to make them more reliable for the future. Although, if this one's been working since 1980, it's already proven the reliability test. Okay, folks, so here is the board. Like I said, it's a Stern MPU 200. Brady Distributing worked on it. Um, their warranty date, I never could decipher. They had their own thing. Very hard to tell. <laughs> um, but it's in pretty decent shape. It's starting to get some corrosion down here on the bottom, but it hasn't got super serious yet. And as you saw, the board is actually booting still. So we're going to address that. The whole thing with these was they installed a battery at the bottom of the board to save the um, bookkeeping settings. And then later on, they started adding some actual gameplay settings into it as well, into this, the, um, the memory. But the game will run without a good battery on it. So you can, take, you can take the battery off and the game will still boot. You'll get strange things on the displays. And if there is a gameplay setting, it'll reset to whatever factory is. Or sometimes it won't even work because it'll... It'll get garbage in the memory. But uh, this was the MPU 200. It runs a little bit differently. It has something to do with timing and the memory. It runs a little bit differently than the previous design. Now, this board set was originally invented by Bally, or, you know, they started using it. They had it designed. And their original one uh, was, I believe, the MPU-17, I believe. This is an MPU-35 little bit um, upgraded version. This one here's got a bunch of parts missing and stuff, but just for example. 
So this is the Bally version, okay? And the difference between the 17 and the 35, I believe, had something to do with the size of ROMs that you could put in it. So this particular one, uh, what are we looking at here? A 2532, maybe? Yeah. So it's a 2532. For whatever reason, so these are like ad, you know, address. These do the addressing. Usually, you only use these two sockets and this one. These three here, I never see anything in. They're usually not even populated. So I don't know why they needed a new board when they had extra sockets, but I guess it just allowed them to use bigger ROMs, and that was the new thing. But they went from the Bally, I believe it's Dash 17, to the Bally Dash 35, and so that's this one. And there are all these little jumpers, like E9, E10, E11, that you can change, that change the address lines and stuff so that you can put different um, EPROMs or PROMs in it. So this is an actual one from the factory, E720-53. So some, some Bally game from 1982. Right? And you can see it has the, the same problem with the corrosion down on the bottom where the battery ate it up. Okay, so Stern was ripping off Bally's designs. So Stern had one called the MPU-100 uh, that was a copy of the MPU-17, I believe. Okay, and then after a while, they upgraded it to this MPU-200. So the main difference between it, one, you can use, um, you can see they're actually using more of those sockets. Right? But also, it had two of these 5101 chips on it, which is the memory that they used to save the settings. The Bally games only had one, and also the Bally, the Stern MPU-100s only had one. So it's just an updated version. There's something with the timing that's different too, but I don't completely understand that. Like the... There's something with the clock that's a little different. But you can see all of these are also socketed. Makes it pretty well. I say all of these. This is the MPU, uh, the CPU, which is a 6800, right? And this is a peripheral interface adapter PIA, which is a 6821. That's Motorola's part number for a 6821. And then this is also a PIA, which is also a 6821. You have two 5101s here on the Bally. It's exactly the same, except you have one 5101. And then you have a 6810 uh, RAM chip. All right, That's Motorola's part number for it. And the one on the Bally, 6810. Okay, and then on the Bally you have... You never have more than three sockets used on the Bally, but they had room for six. Right. And this MPU 200, there's only room for five, and they are actually using four of them. So it's just a more complex software, right? Although you can see that's a 2716, which is a smaller chip. 2716. Don't know on those yet. Okay. So if you wanted to change that 2716 to a 2732, some of these jumpers you could reconfigure. There are um, there is information online to show you exactly how to do that. So you can replace most of them with one chip or two chips. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to carefully remove each one of those chips and clean the legs on the chip, looking for any kind of corrosion or oxidation, and then put it back in. That'll hopefully keep the um, the chip making good contact with the socket for many years to come. So that's a little bit of preventative maintenance. Then we're going to clean the pins on the connectors. There's four connectors. Actually, there's five connectors because they use they actually use the top connector on the stern since they have this, the speech and the soundboard attached there. Um, so we're going to do that first, and then we'll uh, we'll look into the back resoldering it, and then also the battery. So I'm going through and cleaning them, and I taped that label back on, or glued it back on. <laughs> Glue stick. And, oh, and I'm using my little twisted screwdriver. Somebody sent me this a couple years ago. 
This is what you want, people. Look, it's German made. This is the good stuff. If you want one of your very own, I have a link to it on my website. Go to Lions Arcade to our parts page. You too can have a, a crooked screwdriver. It works remarkably well for removing chips. Now, you would think a screwdriver would work just as well. No, 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 no. This is German, so you know they figured it out exactly the right angle to put the bend, exactly the right profile. It works perfect. You wouldn't think it would, but it does. <laughs> this is some nice piece of stuff right here. Wee ha! Got you all in check. So go get you one of those. It, by the way, if you go to my parts page, and it takes you to Amazon when you click this link or any of the other links that would stuff we use in our things. If you buy anything while you're on Amazon, it gives us a tip. 3% about. It's up and down depending on what it is. 3%. So if you buy this, I think these are about 10 bucks. Yeah, that's right. 10 bucks for a crooked screwdriver. Well worth it. I will make like 30 cents for every one of you that does that. So I'm going to get rich off of it. But if you buy anything else after you click the link, so maybe you click this and you say, you know what, I kind of like it, but I'm not going to spend $10 for a crooked screwdriver. But while I'm here on Amazon, after clicking uh, the Lions Arcade Joe's Video Games link, I think I'll uh, spend this time to buy myself a new laptop. Whenever you do that, it gives me 3% of the laptop, too. So a lot of people have been doing that. Thank you. We appreciate it. But I was going to show you, sometimes when you pull these out, they look all corroded and everything, and then sometimes they look brand new. Look at this one. This thing's 40 years old. Looks brand new. No corrosion at all, no oxidization. Nice and shiny. Look at that. Don't let it blind you, people. It's like jewelry. All right, so sometimes, depending on what they're coated with, they look really good. So, very cool. You might wonder, what is the little dot on the chip for? That's fingernail polish. It's an old school repair person's trick. They would check things, and if everything was cool, they'd put a little dot of fingernail polish on it. I haven't figured out completely why they do that, but... Um, that's what that appears to be. Somebody has serviced this board at some point and marked all the chips as good to go. Okay, so we're almost good to go. So I'll clean these. And There's different ways you can clean the pins and the legs. They say that there's now a really good uh, chemical. You can just set them in and it cleans it right up. I usually use like a little file to clean them off. That's what I've used for a long time. Haven't had any problems. But people tell me that's horrible and I shouldn't do that. So... Do what you want to do, but that's what I do. Um, so we're cleaning all that, and once we get that done, we're going to flip over to the back and re-solder these connections. Usually there's bad solder joints on them, so let's check. Let's take a look at that. So here's the back. So these pins are connectors, and usually on the ends, you'll get some bad solder joints where it's broken loose from people just removing the connector. Whenever you pull it off... You know, it twists a little bit, and so the, the end pin will twist a little bit, and you get a little bit of torque on it, and it eventually cracks it loose from the actual solder pad, and you'll see like a little ring around it. But I don't see where any of these have broken loose yet. They all look pretty good. That last one, see how it looks bad? I don't think that's broke loose. I think it's just how it was done in the factory. And then up here we have the header for the soundboard. Maybe that very last one. See how there's like a little line around it? I'm going to resolder them all anyway, but I'm just saying. We caught it before it became a problem. And then down here, you know, usually this can be in the corrosion zone. But we got lucky. None of these are corroded yet. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is re-solder all of those. 
preventative maintenance. We're just making it where once it's resoldered, you can remove that connector another 40 times before it breaks loose again. <laughs> We're just trying to make it more reliable long term, make sure there's a good connection through the wire into the pin, onto this pin, and actually onto the board, you know. So uh, let me resolder those and then we'll finally address the corrosion here. So our battery says 705. Not sure what that means. Might mean July 2005, but I don't know. Let's see if it's got any voltage left in it. <laughs> Here I go playing with my chopsticks again. You would think I would just break out the other lead set. That'd be too easy, people. You know, if you don't like stuff like this, I have to question why you're still watching my videos. <laughs> okay, I think it's dead. I don't think it's got any juice left in it. I think, here. I'm going to use both hands. Here, I'll, I'll give you a nice view of where it was mounted. There we go. About like that. Like that. That worked pretty good. I didn't know I could do this. This might work better in my videos from now on. It is dead as hell. Nothing. We got nothing, people. It's dead. Okay. Alright, so now we gotta clean up the mess that it made. So on the front, here you go in high def. <laughs> This is the reset section that makes the board reset. But I don't see ridiculous damage. All of this black underneath this um, solder mask, though, is corrosion. You see it creeping up here trying to get under that chip, but it doesn't quite. So it's pretty localized. So we did good. And then you got it over here, a little bit on there. Okay. And then the back actually looked a little worse, especially around where that was mounted. So I'll tell you how I handle this. I scrape off all of the solder mask, and I just go to town with a file and sandpaper and get rid of all of that until it's nice and shiny copper again. And then once I do that, I take a little bit of vinegar and brush it on it to neutralize it because it's... Uh, it's alkaline, like the battery leaks alkaline, so vinegar is an acid. So when you put it on there, it kind of neutralizes it a little bit. And then I rinse the vinegar off, and uh, I leave it at that. Now, some people say you can get a conformal coating to cover this back up so that you don't have exposed copper, because apparently that's bad. But again... I've had good results without a conformal coating that conforms to the uh, <laughs> the trace. Uh, so I'm going to start scraping. I'm going to take off a bunch of this. Now, the actual components, they all look pretty good. There's a little bit of something on them. But if I brush them with the vinegar, I think we'll be all right. Most of this looks pretty good. A lot of times you'll get this going all the way up to about here. And then you got a lot of work on your hands. But this one's... Not that bad. We're going to lose our Brady sticker, unfortunately. It was on there for quite a while, but it's got to go. Okay, so let me get rid of a bunch of that, and uh, I'll show you what the shiny copper looks like. Okay, so here's where we're at. You can see the heaviest damage was there. It ate right through. So when we removed it, it took all of that. Right? But that's just a ground plane, so it's not that big of a deal if you still got meat. So all of this. Right? 
So when you do this, depending on how bad it is, sometimes it will go all the way through this ground plane here on the bottom. So you may need to put a jumper wire from here to, you know, one of these. So you, if you look, the ground comes up into the board in a couple spots. All right. So if that gets where it ate through here and it ate through here, you may get a point where your ground is not actually getting to some of this. All right. Now, this is how I do it. I've had good luck with it. This is how I prefer to do it. So I use sandpaper. Right. Do it the way you want to do it. I've had so much criticism about this. It's unbelievable. But, I mean, I've had people tell me, uh, don't use sandpaper. I've had people don't tell me, don't use vinegar. I've had people tell me, don't use a wood workbench. <laughs> I've had people tell me, don't use a file. I've had people tell me, don't use an original board. Put a brand new board in it. Right. I've had people tell me, put an Ardu Arduino in it. Okay. I've had people tell me, um, you know, a hundred different things to use a confirmation, conformal coating. I've had people tell me to use a chemical. I've had people tell me to use a fiberglass brush. I've had people tell me, uh, I'm using the wrong solder, the wrong soldering iron, um, that I talk weird, um, that I, that I don't know what I'm talking about. I didn't go to school for it. <laughs> But at the end of the day, this is the way I do it, and it freaking works. So this is how I do it, all right? So you do it the way you want to do it. So uh, we've cleaned that up. Now I'm going to get the vinegar. Oh, here's the back. Whoo, she rough. Look at that. Okay. So I'm going to get the vinegar, and we're going to brush on some vinegar to hopefully neutralize any alkaline that we didn't get off that's still hiding in there. And uh, then we need to see about our new battery solution. There's a bunch of ways to do that too. Um, so let me let me vinegar vinegar it up, and then we'll go from there. This is my vinegar. The label fell off of it a while back, so we just wrote vinegar on it. I've had the same bottle for like ten years. So I just use a little toothbrush brush it on everywhere that there's a uh, that there was an issue and then now we got to rinse it off because if you leave it on there too long it'll go the other way in its pH value okay so we've replaced the battery with a button battery there's a bunch of different ways you can do this you can put another alkaline battery back on it if you want or whatever they call these right you can put another one of those on if you want but they leak, you know, so if somebody doesn't swap it out in five or six years, it'll probably start leaking again. You can mount wires to the positive and the negative and run it off the board to a battery holder so that if it leaks, it doesn't leak on the board and mess up the board. So I do that sometimes. You can get an NV RAM, which you can take out, uh, I think it's these two, yeah, the 5101s. You take out both of the 5101s and then there's a special board you can put on here and you have to get a. You really have to get a special one for this MPU 200 to do the thing right. Um, that replaces these with with um, RAM that doesn't need a battery backup, so you don't need the battery, but you have to swap the RAM to do that. That's kind of the best solution because you don't ever need a battery again. But the guy that I get those from can't get the parts right now, so um, they're not available to order right now. And then another thing you can do is you can put in. A charging capacitor so you can put in a, a, a large capacitor here that charges and then slowly drains back but the problem with those is if you leave the game off for a couple weeks the battery the capacitor drains out so they call it I think a super cap so this is a pretty good solution you can put a little 2032 battery holder in so I've put the grounded side to the ground and then the positive side goes over to here but this is set up so that it will actually charge that battery so you need a diode in there so I've got a diode on the back of the board blocking it from being able to charge this battery and these batteries don't leak so it works pretty good and if you check the voltage from ground to here which is where the 5 volts ends up I'm not the the battery voltage ends up I've got 3 volts across it that little diode that I put in on the back will drop it even more 
right? I've got a diode mounted. It will drop the voltage a little bit. So it's like 3.2, but with the diode, it's dropping it to like 3 volts or something like that. But that's fine. So we've got it cool. I think that's all good. I think that's about as um, safe as we can get it. Or, you know, we've done everything we can to it. We're going to put it back in the machine and make sure that it still works. I've mounted it back in. These ribbon cables up here are tricky. Basically, with it mounted in the game, the left pin should be the left pin on here. And it should go all the way across. So the last pin here should be the last pin here. If you keep that straight, uh, you can make it happen. <laughs> so I put the mounting screws back in. Let's see if I've broken it. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Quick reset. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, it, it appears to still be up and running. The display appears to still be about the same. So I plugged in the switches for the cabinet. Let's see if any of those actually work. It'll be kind of hard to tell because we don't have anything in it. And I don't have one in the first position. So I don't know if those are working or not. When you don't have anything plugged in, it's kind of hard to tell if you're getting anywhere. <laughs> Who knows? Well, hmm. I guess next time we'll probably have to do some displays. Let me, I'll just plug one up in the top and see if that uh, gives me anything where I can tell if we're in test mode or if any of that stuff's working or, or not. Let me turn it off. I'll, I'll move that one display and uh, see if we can tell anything. Okay, so I remembered the test switch, the ground or something, comes from the solenoid board, actually. I don't know why they do that. But you can't do it without this plugged in or one of these or something. So I have popped the old play field back in. Now, if you didn't see the earlier videos, look at this thing. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, people. That's what we're doing here, though. We're going to fix it. So I need this because some of the connectors that I need to plug in come through on this. This long connector here is the power connector for the play field. I'm going to leave this disconnected because of all of the solenoids being <laughs> who knows. Right? We're not ready for that yet. But I need, I think what I need are these two connectors here. And then a couple of them here. So I'm going to plug that in the best I can and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so we've got all of our grounds plugged in to the solenoid board. I got this connector. It's, it's just a, since th as they went along, they had more and more stuff added to the machines. They ended up with like weird jumpers, like so some of the grounds go up back through this, back to the play field, stuff like that. Uh, another good example is right here. This is the connector for the lamp board that's used on all of them but instead they plug it into the sound board and then there's a jumper from the sound board to the lamp board so they're ran by the same signals just strange okay so I've got most of that plugged in though and but I, like I said I didn't plug in the power supply to this so I believe we'll be all right though let's turn it on make sure nothing burns up Okay, nothing burned up. Now let's see if we can get in the test. That display there's tripping. Still nothing. All right, well, that's our next thing. It may be that it's not completely booting. Oh, there we go. Well, it's doing something.
<laughs> Maybe if I keep pressing the button, it'll work. What do you think? So yeah, I think we need to. I think we need to do some display work still, some lamp board work still. It could be that it's not completely booting, but I, you wouldn't think the displays would come on at all if it wasn't. Oh, we do have one computer-controlled lamp on. We have we have one computer-controlled lamp on, but it could be that it's just stuck on. So we're getting there, folks. We're just not quite there yet. Like that one came on, and then that one. I think it's probably running some kind of code. There we go. Display test. It seems to be cooperating a, a little better. One, two, three, four, five, three, four, <laughs> okay, maybe that's the lamp test. Play field, none of them are working because I don't have the plugged into the power supply. Power supply. Displays again. Maybe solenoids. Boy, she's trying. Maybe that's the switch test, and then that's one of the settings. Okay, it's going to reboot. It's hard to really tell what's going on because see how that's locked on and that one's not on earlier. That one started flashing and that one was off. So I think we still got work to do, maybe still on that MPU board. But it could be, yeah, so I wiggled the door and it did that. Maybe that's the slam or something. I don't know, folks. We're getting there, though. I think next thing up, though, is to rebuild the displays so that we can see a little more of what's going on um, and we can go from there but it's coming along you heard it start talking to us a little bit right so it's trying to it's trying to do its thing but I think that's enough for tonight hopefully our MPU is good if it's not we'll uh, we'll take it back out next time but we kind of can't tell until we get to where something else works we need to get the switches working, the solenoids working. We need to get the the make sure that the soundboard's working. It seems like it is. Get the um, lamps all working and the displays all working. Ah, piece of cake! And then I gotta paint the playfield. Ah, there's nothing to it. We'll get it. So I hope you enjoyed it so far. Make sure to leave your comments below. Give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow with another video. Now, if you haven't checked out my brother Donnie yet. I've told you a thousand times. It's been at least a thousand times. Go check that out. We have another channel here on YouTube. If you like watching uh, us work on these old pinball machines, you'd probably like watching us work on old buildings, old cars, old tools, all kinds of stuff. So go check that out. That's my brother, Donnie. The link is down below, and we will see you on tomorrow's video.